good evening, friends. Good evening and welcome. We'll begin with some words from Psalm 100 before we sing our first hymn together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Well, let's sing together to him now. Let's turn to number 292, 292 in our blue hymn books. The Christian faith has always been a singing faith. And uh, it's good that we can open our mouths and our hearts and our voices and enjoy praising our wonderful Lord. Number 292, come sing the praise of Jesus.
Well sung, friends, well sung. Let's bow our heads now and we'll pray together. I'll read a few verses from one of the Psalms which speak of the wonders of creation and God's creative power, all that man admires as we look at the work of his hands. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth, wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness, and it is night, when all the beasts of the forest creep about. Our gracious Father, when we read words of this kind, we want to thank and praise you for the good and lovely world that you have given to us to enjoy as our temporary home. Despite our sin and rebellion, which has brought pain and violence to the earth, we still constantly rejoice in the beauty and delight of everything that you have made. You've made the cold winters with their icy winds and rain and snow. And you have made the spring and the summer and the autumn with their changing colors the days lengthening and then shortening. You have made the fertile soil that brings forth fruit and vegetables and grass that feeds the cattle and the sheep. You've made the hills and the woodlands with their many kinds of trees. You've made the birds and the wild animals and all of them speak of your glory and power and creativity. And you have made mankind strong and able in so many ways, and yet shot through with weakness and frailty. Indeed, our dear Father, we depend upon you for every breath, for every mouthful of food, for the very water that we drink. And even more so, we depend upon you for our eternal salvation, for our eternal home in your near presence. And we thank you above all, dear Father, that you were willing to send your Son to the world, to take upon his shoulders the penalty of our sin, and to be raised to life immortal and glorious, so that we who are mortal should share his immortality. It is all so wonderful that we cannot deeply grasp it, but we believe the gospel, and we rejoice in your mercy so freely and kindly given to us. And as we spend this evening hour together, please build us up, strengthen us in our faith and in our inner being, so that we should be able in the days ahead to honor you, to live for you, and to serve you. And we ask it all through our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, it is very good to see you all here. I know that some of you have struggled, as I did indeed myself, to park the car. I ended up backing up a one-way street the wrong way, finding a a parking meter. Perhaps some of you did the same. Anyway, very good to see you all here, whether you've come from near or far. And uh, we shall be serving our usual refreshments at the end of the service downstairs, so do stay for teas and coffees and... uh, refreshing cold drinks, and it's a good chance for us to meet each other and talk to each other and encourage each other. Just one or two things to say by way of notices, Um, looking ahead over the next few days. Monday, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., English Cafe for our international friends. Wednesday, uh, we have our lunchtime Bible talk, quarter past one, Andy Gemmell is our preacher this week. And in the evening, half past seven, our congregational prayer meeting very important meeting. Do be there if you possibly can. Thursday, 7 p.m., Tyndale Box for students, young workers, and international friends, Bible study time. And next Sunday, 
uh, as usual, our services at 11 in the morning and half past six in the evening. But don't dash off at the end unless you absolutely have to, because it's a good chance for us to look at each other, uh, to recognize each other, to say, how do you do, and uh, to encourage each other in the faith. Well, now we're going to sing together again. Let's turn to number 436, 436 in our blue hymn books. And here we have the hymn, No weight of gold or silver can measure human worth. No soul secures its ransom with all the worth, with all the wealth of earth. It's a hymn about the precious blood of Christ. Number 436. We turn now to our Bible reading, the Word of the Lord, in the book of Judges, chapter 11. And you'll find this if you have one of our hardback Bibles on page 211. So the book of Judges, chapter 11. We're about halfway through the book of Judges at this stage. And we're going to read the story of Jephthah, beginning at chapter 11, verse 1. And I'll read to the end of his story in chapter 12, verse 7. So we'll get the whole sweep of what the author says about the life, work, and influence of Jephthah. So Judges chapter 11, verse 1. Now Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, They drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob, and worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. After a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, 
Come and be our leader, that we may fight with the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now, when you're in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we've turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight with the Ammonites, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight with the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said, What do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan, now therefore restore it peaceably. Jephthah again sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and said to him, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they sent also to the king of Moab, and he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. Then they journeyed through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and arrived on the east side of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the boundary of Moab. Israel then sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to our country. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people together and encamped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. And they took possession of all the territory of the Amorites from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the wilderness to the Jordan. So then, the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? Will you not possess what Chemosh your God gives you to possess? And all that the Lord, our God, has dispossessed before us, we will possess. Now, are you any better than Balak, the the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever contend against Israel, or did he ever go to war with them? While Israel lived in Heshbon, and its villages, and in Aroer, and its villages, and in all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon, three hundred years, why did you not deliver them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them from Aroer to the neighborhood of Minith, twenty cities, and as far as Abel Karamim with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, 
You've opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So he said, Go. Then he sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, no, they said to him, then say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel for six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city, in Gilead. This is the word of the Lord, and may it be a blessing to us tonight. We're now we're going to sing together again. You'll see that national unity amongst the Israelites was badly broken at that point when the Gileadites took up arms against the Ephraimites and vice versa. So we're going to sing this little psalm, 133, 133a, you'll find it in our books which is a psalm about the delightfulness of unity amongst the Lord's people. 133a. Now we'll have some quieter moments while our offering is taken up.
Well, let us pray again. And in these quiet moments together, I want to read a very familiar short passage from Paul's letter to the Galatians in which he speaks of the fruit of the Spirit. And we'll pray now that the Lord will lovingly and kindly produce this fruit in our lives and the lives of other Christians we know, the lives of the churches up and down the country more and more. Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. We thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, that it is by the Holy Spirit, your Spirit, that we are born again as we come to Christ. And it is he, your Spirit, who dwells within our hearts, changing us. And we do pray that these lovely, beautiful, delightful qualities may emerge in our lives more and more. We know, dear Father, that sometimes we are people who are hard to love. And therefore we pray that you will help us to be more filled with love. We know that our circumstances of life can sometimes be very challenging and frustrating, and therefore we pray that you will give us joy. We know that our lives sometimes, our minds, can be in turmoil, and therefore we pray that the peace given by the Spirit will fill us more and more. We know, dear Father, that our patience is often tested And therefore we ask you to make us people who become more calm, more patient, more enduring. We pray too that you will give us kindness because we know that the world lacks it and our own hearts often lack it. We pray too that you will deepen in us the desire to live a good life, a life that is pleasing in your sight, filled with goodness. And faithfulness, dear Father, By nature, we are fickle creatures, we know that. And we pray, therefore, that an enduring faithfulness, faithfulness to you above all, faithful to the Lord Jesus, and faithful to one another in all our relationships, that this will characterize us. And gentleness, dear Father, we live in a world characterized so often by fierceness, and we pray that you will help us, therefore, to be gentle, as we learn to love others. And last but not least, self-control. We know, dear Father, that self-control is at the heart of New Testament godliness. And we pray, therefore, that you will help us to exercise it more and more in every part of our lives so that we may follow the example of our Lord Jesus. So, dear Father, please continue to have your way with us Fill us afresh more and more with the Holy Spirit. And please, we pray, for the sake of your name and your glory, enable our lives to display these qualities. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, now, before we have um, our sermon on Jephthah, let's sing together again. And you'll see the hymn on the screens. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word.
Well, let's turn to our passage uh, in Judges chapters 11 and 12, if you will, page 211 and 212 in our Bibles. Judges 11 and 12, the story of Jephthah. Now, the title that I've chosen for the sermon tonight is Jephthah, an Imperfect Saviour. Or perhaps this could be a good subtitle, More Headstrong Than Wise. Some of you may know that George Frederick Handel, the great composer whose most famous work, I guess, was The Messiah, also wrote an oratorio, an extended choral work called Jephthah. It was his last oratorio, and apparently Handel himself conducted its first performance in Covent Garden in London in 1752. Now, Jephthah is certainly not as well known as the Messiah, but it has by no means disappeared from the classical repertoire, and you do hear excerpts from it occasionally on the radio. Anyway, I thought I would get hold of a copy of the words of Handel's oratorio to see how closely they tallied with the biblical account. I suppose I was asking myself, how are people reading the Bible in 1750? It was that kind of question. But I I wanted to ask myself what it was about the story of Jephthah that particularly intrigued Handel and his librettist, who was a clergyman called Thomas Morell. And it was no great surprise to me to discover that the emotional center, the dramatic center of the oratorio, is Jephthah's rash vow to offer up as a burnt offering the first person who comes out of his house after his return from defeating the Ammonites. Now, Handel's librettist, Mr. Morell, his scriptwriter, changes the story quite a lot and gives it a happy ending. So in Handel's Jephthah, an angel appears at the critical moment, just as the angel appeared when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son and said, don't do it. So the angel appears in the oratorio and and the same thing happens and the girl is spared. She then has to live a life of perpetual celibacy which makes her fiancé tear his hair out. The librettist, I guess with artistic license, introduces a fiancé and a mother and various other people who don't actually appear in Judges chapter 11. But Handel's oratorio does reflect the way the story is presented in Judges in one important respect, and that is this matter of where the dramatic centre of the story lies. And this is very different from the stories of Deborah and Barak and Gideon, which we've been reading in recent weeks. In those stories, it's the battles which are recounted powerfully with lots of vivid detail. Do you remember Jael and the tent peg and Sisera as he went to sleep in the tent? Do you remember Gideon and his servant Pura as they crept down the mountainside after dark and listened to two Midianite soldiers discussing things in the camp? And that gave him courage to go ahead and fight the battle. And we get a great story of the battle, the smashing of jars, the blowing of trumpets, and so on. So that's the big center there, the actual battles. Whereas here, in Judges 11, the battle story is told in only two verses, verses 32 and 33, whereas nine verses are given to Jephthah's vow and the harrowing account of his daughter coming to meet him out of the house and what happened to her afterwards. The emotionally powerful language here comes in the nine verses about the daughter, not the two verses about the battle. Well, let's take this story in three sections and under these three headings, which are all about Jephthah himself. First, good at geography and history. Second, bad at making vows. Third, bad at maintaining national unity. So first of all, good at geography and history. Now, we saw last week, as we just uh, bit into the first few verses of chapter 11, that Jephthah, in some ways, is a striking foreshadower of the Lord Jesus. We saw that, like Jesus, he was rejected by his own people. In the first three verses of chapter 11, he's disinherited by his brothers. He's driven out of his father's house by them. And we saw that this this figure, rejected by his own people, later becomes the saviour of his own people. And we saw that the one who became their saviour insisted that he should be also their leader. So Jephthah is the rejected saviour who becomes the people's leader. And Jesus, too, is the rejected saviour who is shown to be truly the one who carries all authority and therefore must be obeyed. But there's a further parallel. It's a less important one, but it's an interesting parallel between Jephthah and the Lord Jesus 
and that is that both of them knew their Old Testaments rather well. And it's in Judges 11, verses 12 to 28, that we see how good Jephthah is at geography and history. He's not just a muscle-bound hulk who rushes into battle shouting with his broadsword. He's done some thinking and some study about geography and history, and before he picks up his sword, he makes a brave attempt at diplomatic, nonviolent conflict resolution. So let's trace this, this through. We'll start at verse 12. You'll see in verse 12 he sends messengers, a diplomatic mission to the Ammonite king with one question. What do you have against me that you have come to me to fight against my land? In other words, what's your problem? What is the nature of this bone that you have decided you want to pick with me? So the king of the Ammonites sends his answer back in verse 13 because Israel, on coming up from Egypt, took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore it peaceably. Now, if we could have our map. <clears throat> my friend Kenan Berker has created this map for me, which will appear by magic on the screen. There we are. <laughs> Kenan, thank you so much. And this, I think, I hope will give you some, uh, some idea of, of, of the main places uh, and how the, the land is all set out there. <clears throat> So let's allow Jephthah to instruct us in geography and history in the next few verses. In verse 13, the Ammonite king is saying, when you Israelites came up from Egypt, now the, Egypt is right down here, about at the top of the bass guitar, uh, right, right down, low level down here. He's saying, when you came up from Egypt, and the exodus from Egypt took place um, roughly in the 1400s BC, and Jephthah lived in about 1100 BC, so something like 300 years have passed since the Exodus. So the king of the Ammonites says, when you came here from Egypt 300 years ago, you took away my land. You robbed my nation of our land. From the Arnon River, that's the one that runs there into uh, the Dead Sea, right up to the river Jabbok. Please now restore it peaceably. Now you'll see where those two rivers run. Um, so the the Arnon uh, into the Dead Sea and the Jabbok in, 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 into the River Jordan. And the River Arnon uh, forms the northern boundary of the land of Moab, the ancient kingdom of Moab, and the River Jabbok lies something like 40 to 50 miles north of the Arnon and flows into the Jordan up there. So the piece of land that the Ammonite king is claiming that the Israelites stole from Ammon 300 years previously is that block of land bounded by the Jabbok to the north, the Arnon to the south, and the River Jordan to the west. It's a, a sizable piece of land, roughly 50 miles from north to south, roughly 50 miles from east to west. You might, might say about as big as Ayrshire and Lanarkshire put together. Now, just to go on a tangent for a moment, let's keep the map up just for a moment. We human beings are deeply and intractably tribalistic and nationalistic. There's something deep in our nature, it's in our DNA, isn't it, to want to belong to one group which is defined as being over against all other groups. It's only in the Lord's church that these tribalisms get broken down and we're able to accept each other and love each other as true brothers and sisters across international, racial, class, bound, all the boundaries. Uh, the Lord's Church is a wonder, isn't it? It's an absolute wonder. But otherwise, by, by nature, human beings are tribalistic. And the possession of land is the main thing that strengthens the tribe. You might say at one level, the history of the human race is the history of wars over the possession of land. I mean, this is the issue which is causing this terrible, heartbreaking bloodshed at the moment between Israel and the Palestinians. Mr. Putin, if I understand uh, the situation correctly, is wanting to control that eastern part of the Ukraine because it's a very fertile area and it produces vast amounts of food every year. Land is the key. Land produces agricultural produce, water, timber, minerals, metals, coal and oil. So the tribe or nation that expands its territory expands its strength. And it's this desire to expand Ammonite territory that explains the arrival of the Ammonite army in Gilead to challenge Jephthah. You stole this piece of land from us 300 years ago. Now restore it peaceably. Peaceably. That is to say, without a fight. 
In other words, let's get together, we'll have a banquet, we'll make some pretty speeches to each other, we'll shake hands, sign a piece of paper, pose smilingly for the press photographers, and then go home. Peaceable. Let's do it peaceably. Now, this is where Jephthah's success at higher grade history and geography really begins to shine. So keeping the map up, we'll take a fairly brisk walk through the message that Jephthah sends back to the Ammonite king, starting in verse 16. Thus says Jephthah, verse 15, thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites. In other words, your facts are wrong, king of of Ammon. But verse 16, when Israel came up from Egypt, Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and then came to Kadesh, which you'll see at the very bottom of the map. That is Kadesh Barnea. Verse 17, Israel then sent messengers to the king of Edom. You'll see where the land of Edom is, saying, please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom said, no. Then they asked the same thing of the king of Moab, but he wouldn't consent either. So Israel remained at Kadesh, says Jephthah. Then, verse 18, they went round the land of Edom, on the south side of Edom, and round the land of Moab. In other words, they respected the wishes of the kings of Edom and Moab. And then they arrived at the east side of the land of Moab and pitched camp on the north side, the other side of the river Arnon. But they didn't enter the territory of Moab because the Arnon was the northern boundary of Moab. And verse 19, Israel then sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, not the Ammonites, but the Amorites, and he was the king at Heshbon. You'll see that's in the disputed area. And they send the same request to him to pass through his territory so they can get on their way to Canaan and cross the River Jordan. But Zion said no. He mustered his army. He fought with Israel. And notice verse 21 because it's important. And the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. So Israel took possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. In other words, that whole block of land between the Jabbok and the Arnon, um, which the king of Ammon is claiming um, uh, from, from Israel. Jephthah is saying it was never Ammonite territory. It belonged to the Amorites, a different people. And Jephthah's claim is that it belongs to Israel because the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Israel the victory over King Sion and his army. And then Jephthah draws his conclusion in verse 23. So then, the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And are you to take possession of them? In other words, you Ammonites have no right, no historical right to that block of land at all. Your claim made back in verse 13, that Israel took away your land from the Arnon to the Jabbok has no foundation in historical reality. It was never your land. It was Amorite territory, which Israel took over from the Amorites because of the kind gift of the Lord. So what Jephthah is doing here in verses 15 to 27 is arguing his case that the block of land in question properly belongs to Israel. And the Ammonites, therefore, have no right to it. He argues his case first from history, from the historical facts that he sets out here, and he argues his case secondly from theology. In verse 24, will you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? And all that the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess. In other words, if your deity Chemosh has any strength and power at all, be satisfied with the land that he gives you, and we'll be satisfied with the land that the Lord our God gives us. So Jephthah, of course, is really giving Chemosh a poke in the eye at that point. Then Jephthah returns to history again. In verse 25, he reminds the king of the Ammonites that when Israel, 300 years previously, was journeying around Moab, the Moabite king Balak never presumed to go to war with them. And then finally, in verse 26, he makes the point that Israel have been living in this disputed area in Heshbon and Aroah, which is a bit further south, and along the banks of the river Arnon for 300 years, a very long time. And the Ammonites have never in all that time raised a voice of protest. So what on earth are they bleating about now? 
That's his point. I, therefore, verse 27, have not sinned against you. The fault is not me, and you do me wrong by making war on me. And then he says, and it's a kind of prayer, the Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. So Jephthah boldly calls the Lord to resolve the dispute, in effect, to give victory to whichever side has the right of it. And that's exactly what happens. The king of the Ammonites is in no mood to be persuaded by Jephthah's arguments from history. So he sends a curt response to Jephthah, as verse 28 implies. And then the spirit of the Lord, perhaps in answer to Jephthah's prayer of verse 27, comes upon Jephthah, and he and his army decisively defeat the Ammonites, who, in the words of verse 33, are subdued before the people of Israel. Okay, Janet can go off now for a moment. Now let me just make two brief points about this before we come to Jephthah's vow. The first is to do with the distribution of land. At ground level, our eye level if you like, the nations and tribes battle over pieces of land. They always have done and still do and I guess they always will. But from the Bible's point of view, from God's point of view, it is God who distributes land to the peoples of the world. Jeremiah, for example, speaks of the Lord God raising up one kingdom and causing another one to fall. Or think of Paul in his famous speech to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17. He said, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. In other words, Paul is saying it is God who distributes land to different people groups at different times. Now, within that general picture of God's sovereignty in land distribution, the case of Israel is a special case because the possession of Canaan, that particular piece of land, that was a major component in God's original covenant promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. However, since the coming of Jesus, membership of God's covenant people is no longer tied up with living in the land, the geographical land of Israel. Do you remember how Jesus spoke to this Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4? He said to her, the hour is coming when neither on Mount Gerizim in Israel nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. True worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So back in Jephthah's day and throughout the Old Testament period, it was important that the land given by the Lord to Israel should be possessed and lived in by the Israelites. And that's what uh, Jephthah says here in verse 21. And that's right and true for the Old Testament people of God. But for us today, it's a question of worshipping the Lord in spirit and in truth, not worshipping at Jerusalem. The Christian church has no geographical entailments. Well, now, secondly, different point, but let me say this. I want to encourage all of us to develop an interest in Bible geography and history. In fact, I'd put it like this. I would say that these are not really optional extra subjects for the serious Bible reader. They need to be part of our main curriculum. Let me put it like this. The heart of the Christian life is getting to know the Lord better and better. That means getting to know the Lord and all his concerns better. And clearly, he's very concerned with Bible history and Bible geography. We know that because he includes so much of it in the Bible, in the New Testament, just as much as in the Old. I made the point last week that it's the history, it's the historical account of what God has done that distinguishes Christianity from all the other world faiths. So if we don't interest ourselves in the history and the geography of the Bible, we're denying ourselves a significant part of what it means to know and to understand the Lord. So here's a suggestion. Why not get together with a good friend or with your spouse, arm yourselves with strong tea and a large slice of cake, and sit down together at the table to do a little bit of historical and geographical Bible study? Take a passage like this one, and there are hundreds throughout the Bible. Get hold of some good Bible maps. There are good ones available these days on the internet, as well as in the backs of some Bibles. And then follow the stories through. 
And if you can get hold of Bible maps which give the physical dimensions of the land as well as the political boundaries that are marked, it's even better. It's much more exciting. So, for example, when you notice for the first time in your life that the Sea of Galilee is nearly 700 feet below sea level and that the Dead Sea is nearly 1,300 feet below sea, sea level, you simply whistle with surprise and joy. Trust me. <coughs> so... There's the first thing. Jephthah was good at history and geography. And if you and I can develop a similar interest, it will actually help to bring our Bible study to life in all sorts of ways, and we will get to know the Lord better. Our reaction, I suppose, is to see lots of names and think, I can't be bothered to work through that. But do let's bother. There will be real dividends for us. Well, let's look on now. Secondly, Jephthah was bad at making vows. I pointed out earlier that the battle with the Ammonites is described in a very low-key way just in verses 32 and 33, and the big focus of attention in this final part of chapter 11 is on this wretched vow and its consequences. This day of battle and victory should have ended in celebration, but instead it ends in tragedy. And the storyteller's art is being practiced here to a fine degree. Look, for example, at verse 34. Jephthah came home, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and dances. She's leaping, skipping joyfully uh, out of the front door, because no doubt the great news of daddy's great victory against the Ammonites has preceded him to the house. So she leaps out of the house. I guess she throws her arms around her father. Daddy, well done. The Lord has blessed you. Daddy, I love you so much. Then look at the power of the text. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Now, I won't walk through it verse by verse, but let me just make a few comments. <clears throat> the Bible is not against people making vows. Now, the Apostle Paul, at one point in the book of Acts, makes a vow which he's very careful to keep. You and I make vows if we get married. In the marriage service, a man and his wife Vow, it's a very solemn promise, vow to each other to be faithful to each other, come what may. In Psalm 22, King David says, my vows I will perform. And there are warnings in the book of Proverbs not to make rash vows. But Jephthah's vow is surely the classic Bible example of a vow that should never have been made and a vow that should never have been kept. Look at verse 30. Why did Jephthah say to the Lord, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out or whoever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. What can have possessed this man to say such a thing as that, especially when the book of Deuteronomy clearly says that human sacrifice is detestable to the Lord and the Lord hates it? Didn't Jephthah know that? He knew his Old Testament history well, so why didn't he know his Old Testament law? Well, probably the answer is that he had allowed the beliefs and practices of Israel's pagan neighbors to influence him strongly. In pagan views of man and God, man doesn't trust and obey and allow the Lord to provide. Man learns to manipulate the deity, to put pressure on the deity so as to get results. And human sacrifice in pagan thinking is a very powerful way of securing the favor of the gods. In other words, if you're prepared to go through the pain and suffering and cost of sacrificing a human being, especially your own child, the gods owe you some big favors. That's the pagan line of thought. Human sacrifice, as it were, twists the arm of the deity up his back and he has to favor you. Now, some commentators on Judges have tried to let Jephthah off the hook by saying that he must have had an animal sacrifice in mind. And that view, I think, is reflected in our ESV translation, which says, at least in the main text in verse 31, that whatever comes out of my house to meet me, I will offer as a burnt offering. But if Jephthah's intention had been to make an animal sacrifice, surely he wouldn't have batted an eyelid when his daughter appeared. He'd have been watching for the first kid or or, or lamb, or dog even, to come running up to him. 
The fact that he tears his clothes and cries, alas, my daughter, shows that he must have been thinking of human sacrifice. His thought process, <clears throat> influenced by pagan ideas, was something like this. Here he was. He was about to take on the Ammonites. It was a huge challenge. So he thought, if I, if I promise the Lord to make him a really costly burnt offering sacrifice, offering up one of my domestic servants, it will put pressure on him, and he will help me and my army to win the battle. The promise of the sacrifice in Jephthah's thinking was the key to victory. He wasn't trusting the Lord. In a sense, he was trusting himself. And in that way, he slipped from biblical thinking into pagan thinking. I guess one lesson for us is to take great care over what kind of values we welcome into our minds and hearts. The world's values are pressing in at us all the time, and it's all too possible for us to give them house room alongside the values taught by the Bible. And for example... A Christian might be very familiar with the Bible's teaching about humility and service, and yet that Christian might also follow the world's desires about status and success and prominence. Oh yes, I know the Bible teaches me to be a humble servant, but actually I want to be thought of as important and successful. I want to be noticed. Well, let's take warning from Jephthah about the values of the world proving to influence our behavior more than the values of the Bible. Jephthah didn't have the sense or the godliness at this point to retract his vow. He went on ahead with it. As verse 39 puts it, he did with her according to his vow that he had made. And what had he vowed? Verse 31, I will offer it up as a burnt offering. That's what he did. Two months to roam the hills and to weep with her friends because she could never be married, and then the knife, and then the fire. He should never have made that vow, and he should never have kept that vow. Friends, let's beware of making rash promises. So good at history, bad at vows, <clears throat> and third, bad at preserving national unity. And we'll look here at the first uh, little part of chapter 12. Jephthah's great victory... <clears throat> Jen, perhaps we could uh, show that fine piece of geography again. Thank you very much. Kenan's handiwork. <clears throat> Thank you. Jephthah's great victory takes place in the land of Gilead, a bit to the north of uh, the Jabbok River. Now, the tribe of Ephraim lived on the western side of the River Jordan, the left-hand side. So when they hear of Jephthah's victory, their pride is touched in a big way because they fancy themselves as the top warriors in Israel. I guess the British army in its history knows something about regimental pride, where one regiment looks down its nose at another regiment because it reckons it's tougher and stronger and better trained. Well, the Ephraimites obviously fancied themselves as the crack regiment in Israel. And when they hear that Jephthah and his troops from the tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, have subdued the Ammonites. They're so full of wounded pride that they muster their army. It was a great army. Just look at the numbers mentioned in chapter 12, verse 6. They cross the Jordan from west to east. They find Jephthah, and they say to him, verse 1, why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Now, you may remember that an identical confrontation had happened to Gideon back in chapter 8. There's no need to turn back to it. But when Gideon defeated the Midianites, a contingent of Ephraimite soldiers had confronted him in exactly the same way. And Gideon had been very diplomatic. He'd soothed their egos. He'd said, oh, brother Ephraimites, everybody knows that you're the crack regiment in Israel. It's okay. So he cleverly defused the situation. But Jephthah <laughs> was different from Gideon. He'd been the leader of a band of outlaws. He had his advanced hires in history and ge geography, perhaps, but he was a fierce warrior. No smooth diplomacy for, for Jephthah. So he says to them in verse 2, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you Ephraimites, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against them, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? 
Having said which, he nods his head to his commanders, they draw their swords, and they start cutting up these Ephraimites. There was racial provocation or intertribal provocation as well. Look at verse 4. The men of Gilead uh, struck Ephraim um, because they said, you are fugitives from Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. There's tribal needle there. It's almost like the supporters of two famous football teams when they're on their very worst behavior with each other. Now, Jephthah and his men at this point behave ruthlessly, horribly. (laughs) Clearly, they kill a number of Ephraimites on the spot. And as the Ephraimites see that they're being defeated, the rest of them take off and, I guess, flee literally westwards to try to cross the Jordan and get back to their home territory. But Jephthah sends his men to capture the fords of the Jordan. And when an Ephraimite soldier asks permission to cross over, he is then given a pronunciation test. Um, Jephthah knew about the the regional accents, of course. There have always been regional accents about, haven't there? We know all about that in Britain, don't we? Think of us, Western Isles, Abaddonian, Glaswegian, Edinburgh. Or go down to England, Yorkshire, Lancashire, London. Take a word like like this. Think of this word, M-U-R-D-E-R. You got that? M-U-R-D-E-R. How would, how would a man from Ayrshire, say, pronounce that with a really sort of thick, quite strong... How would a, an Ayrshireman say that? Okay. <laughs> murder. How, murder. How would, you, yeah, how would you pronounce it? Say it again. That's it. Murder. I wish, I wish I could say it like that. I would love to be able to say, for example, in the Cornhill classroom, Sebastian, if you don't do your sermon preparation more carefully and industriously, I will murder you. (laughs) But I can't say it like that. I've been practicing all week and I still can't say it. Problem is, English tongue, English jaw, English brain. All I can say is murder. Just sounds so tame, doesn't it? I wouldn't really do it in the classroom, usually. Now, Jephthah. Here he is. He capitalizes on his knowledge of local pronunciation. He knew that the Ephraimites could not sound the sound SH. They could not say shibboleth. Shibboleth simply means a flowing stream. That, that, that's not the point, really. It's, it's just this word. It's the SH thing. All they could say was shibboleth. And as a consequence, 42,000 of them were slaughtered. Who was, who was at fault here? The volatile, jealous Ephraimites who couldn't bear not to be at the center? Or Jephthah and his Gileadites? I guess both were. But it was tragic because these were all Israelites. In fact, they were so close, they were really cousins. Ephraim and Manasseh were the two sons of Joseph, the great patriarch, that godly patriarch. Now, there are lessons, aren't there? Christian people also can become volatile, and jealous of each other, wanting to be preened. That's what the Ephraimites wanted. They wanted to be preened and noticed, rather than just being happy to serve in places where the spotlight doesn't shine. And where there is volatility and self-promotion, relationships always become strained. These early verses of chapter 12, they have important lessons to teach us about humility and service and being delighted to see other Christians doing their work and their ministry well. Jephthah was bad at preserving the unity of the people of God. Well, friends, almost finished, but just a final word. How can we best assess Jephthah as we look at the big picture of the Bible's story? Well, he is indeed a Christ-like figure in certain very important respects. The rejected one becomes the saviour and leader of God's people but he is a very imperfect saviour. His successor, chapter 13 onwards, the mighty Samson, if anything, is even more imperfect than Jephthah. One of the functions, then, of these flawed saviour figures is to show the human race that we need a saviour without imperfections, a saviour who not only decisively conquers our enemy, the devil, but displays in his character the unsullied perfections 
of self-control, gracious speech, tender mercy, and love. We need the Savior who is truly the friend of sinners. We need the only one who by his atoning death and glorious resurrection is able to bring us into the eternal presence of God. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear God, our Father, we do thank you for these lessons from a character like Jephthah, sometimes negative lessons, warnings about how not to behave, and our prayer is that you will help us to heed them. But we thank you again that after all these hundreds of years of preparation, finally the perfect Savior was given to us, and he was willing to lay down his life to sacrifice everything so that we might be saved forever. So please, dear Father, fill our hearts afresh with gratitude for him and keep us persevering and glad and joyous in our faith, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to sing our final hymn now about the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Let's turn to number 625, 625 in our hymn books. Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly. 625. <clears throat>
remain standing for our final prayer. Words of John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. Lord Jesus, in your presence we bow. We thank you that you are the one who ranks before everybody and that our salvation comes from you and you alone. Amen.